Welcome to the American Intelligence Media. I'm your host, Douglas Gabriel. I'm here today with Christopher Earl Strunk. As you know, we like to follow him because he's constantly battling with the courts for moral issues. And today's moral issue we're going to talk about is one that seems to have created absolute insanity in America, political insanity, federal and state insanity, and that's the question of what I would simply call infanticide. They call it abortion, late-term abortion, but I would call it murder. Now, Christopher Strunk has brought a case, because he always brings a case, against the people who are doing these crazy, evil things. So I want him to explain some of this uh, from a legal point of view. So before we get off into the weeds with all the uh, implications of this, he can explain the reality that most of us do not know. But I know, because I was a midwife assistant, and I know the wars against the midwives, and I know that they don't want you to have a healthy birth, and I've been at, you know, I've been there, right at, in the front lines with that. So Christopher, welcome to the show, and can you explain to our listeners, what is this about, uh, we were just discussing this, babies are basically assets. How does that happen? Well, they're, they're actually free until they're registered as an asset of the, of the a collateral for the debt of the country in 1933. Um, because the banks had gone under and basically everything, we had a banking holiday and everything was in a turmoil. Um, everything was seized as booty in order to collateralize the, the repayment of the debt. And, and part of that, uh, coming out of the, uh, Hoover administration, uh, which with, with Eugene Myers as the head of the federal reserve, they wrote what became emergency, emergency, um, <laughs> the emergency banking relief act that was implemented and all of the state banks and all the banks in general had to become members of the federal reserve or else they wouldn't get any cash flow. They wouldn't get any uh, cash in which to participate. So all the governors urged all of their congressmen to vote it up and it was done overnight. And that within this three day period after FDR took his inauguration, um, uh, oath, and that um, all of the banks, uh, all the state banks, became Federal Reserve registered banks, and as a result, all requirements were that um, all transactions were to be used as collateral against the debt due um, by the United States, and. Um, and the, the goal, all the gold was seized in, in June uh, or May, actually it was May Day in uh, 1933, and it was supposedly taken and put in Fort Knox, et cetera, in order to pay for the New Deal, et cetera. And, uh, um, but nonetheless, all, by 1935, they had devised a, a system so that every child born would be duly uh, registered and then hypothecated um, as an asset to be used as collateral for the pay repayment of the debt. In other words, you have an expectation over your lifetime of cash flow, of producing, um, of both being consumer and producing, and that they have an expectation in every bundle sold uh, every bundle of birth certificates sold within days of the birth um, is permanent. I mean, you can't change your name in the bundle. You can't change your birth, uh, your 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 sex, or your or or any of the specifics that were certified by a doctor or a midwife. All that goes in and gets sold, and the government gets a, a portion of funds under the Social Security Act as a result of the of the hypothecation of that. Uh, certificate it's a security so um, all children once they're registered are in effect the public property of the of the system and we call it the emergency government that we're still under under what was uh, on that same day proclamation 2040 which says until further notice of the president um, uh, we're under an emergency period and that eight we're in the 86th year of that emergency and we're operating under this emergency banking relief act which is in place and and it it affects everything and it's it's underlying everything but 
there are approximately 500 uh, certificate bundles out there that can that are sold within days by the state uh, to, through the uh, through the uh, the equivalent of Standard and Poor's back then, but it was the uh, the markets, and it's a it's it's a bundled security, a futures uh, security on expectation of performance. So um, that the whole system runs that way, the mortgage market, everything. It's all based upon your social security number and the fact that your name is registered or you're naturalized at the point that you become naturalized, you uh, you get bundled. You know, within a certain number of days, the the they break it into around 500 uh, person bundles, so it's manageable. And there's a, you know an equivalent of expectation of performance of each bundle sure, as now, a security. Let me uh, break that down in a simple term. So then the conspiracy that the moment that you're born, you are given part of a war debt for wars you don't know anything about that you may be paying for the rest of your life. Because as we know, we can't pay off the debt to the Federal Reserve, and that's where the war debt is. So essentially, you are bound as an economic slave to war debt from the moment that you're born. And the reason that we brought... Correction, correction, from the moment that you're registered. Sorry. <laughs> so that yes. any... Any newborn who is not registered is free. They're actually free citizens. They're actually, um, they're what I do is try to re relieve the person of their of the public burden, which has been placed upon them through their registration uh, as a security. So, th so they're up for grabs. All the illegals coming across the border, they're free, believe it or not. And they, when when they use the um, the birth the uh, abortion process there they can take those fetuses and they can take those fetal parts and use them without any oversight all right and the same happens in the birth clinic clinics but as soon as there's a registration boy oh boy that is absolutely the fact that 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 uh it, it's an indenture it's a an indenture and it's it's property that the government has oversight and uh, a responsibility to secure and the governor being the important person in that regard um and this is critical because of your angle that you approached the question of what i call infanticide these late-term abortions or abortions in the state of new york and your legal angle on that is basically it's going to shock people to hear it but it's a legal angle and so i want to make sure that we justify that it is not an exaggeration to say that the government looks at you as a government-issued object and that you have, as Christopher has just explained, you have the possibility in your lifetime of making a lot of money and paying a lot of taxes, and basically you're theirs, and they've already spent those money, that money, those taxes. They've already spent it. They've already planned it all out, the whole thing. But before you're registered, as he pointed out, not born, and not, and not conceived, and not in utero, and not nine months, and not late term, not whatever, but the moment that you are registered, then you're no longer free. But you're free until that, and so you just made a point that I didn't even understand in our previous conversations, that both aliens as well as uh, uh, children before they're registered are free, and so they are basically up for grabs, and they are an asset. Now, Unfortunately, we're going to get into a very, very, very strange position here. But when we're talking about $500 million going from the federal government to Planned Parenthood and then Planned Parenthood turning around and giving $50 million of that back to the Democrat Party, this is nothing but political maneuvering. When we find out that, that the uh, birth control pills from the Planned Parenthood in the urban areas, they're just placebos. Why? They want those babies, and they want the babies because, as we have seen through the people who went in, uh, what is it, Veritas, or the, this, uh, the group that went in and filmed, the people at Planned Parenthood saying, yeah, we sell the baby parts, and they're premium, and if we get the babies, you know, why they're still alive, and cut the da 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 da, -da, -da it's more money, and I can get a bigger, nicer car, I can get myself a Ferrari, and then they threw that stuff out because they said that, you know, it was doctored or something. No, it's not doctored. The Planned Parenthood doesn't help anyone plan parenthood. It helps them plan not to be a parent. And so these government agencies oftentimes are the exact opposite of what they say they are. So we're not going to get in 
in a minute we will, but I want Christopher to explain what he's doing first. We'll get into the whole, th just the absolute horribleness of it all in a minute, but we do need to understand that this is a proven fact, that Planned Parenthood is, it, it is a butcher shop for babies, and the babies are assets, and if they can uh, cut them up the right way, they get more money, and the epithelial cells, the, uh, the umbilical cord, the placenta, every part of that baby has magical elements, especially when they're in utero. So while they're still in utero, the epithelial cells look as if they are immortal. So there are many, many rich people who take those stem cells and epithelial cells and they experiment with them for longevity purposes. So you cannot imagine, and especially if the baby is in a certain condition, then the blood itself becomes worth as much as the baby's body. So this is a market. This is, this is a racket. This is a horrifying monopoly that we the people actually foot the bill for, and yet the people who run the Planned Parenthood clinics make a fortune off of it. So now, Christopher, I think I've set the stage for you to tell us how it is that you're approaching this. Well, I wanted to add in that the important part of what happened in 1933 is that FDR, as governor of New York at the time before he became president, had ordered uh, that they had passed a law in New York that said that the government was the third party to a marriage. You know, there was common law marriage. If you want to live with somebody and you can claim you're married, you have the right to do that as a civil right. And that was eliminated in New York. And the government, the government became the third party to a marriage. In other words, the husband and wife became the collateral for the debt through the registration of their marriage. And that any, any of the issue from that marriage, a baby, the fetus, became the property through the marriage. So that even when that baby is born, the government still has authority over it through as an issue of the marriage, which is no longer common law. So, but by 1938, in the Erie Lackawanna Railroad case, uh, um, the the <laughs> the, the uh, common law per se was eliminated, and they came out with statutes that in the uh, federal federal rules and, the, and all the state rules, the civil rules, procedure, etc. So that all common law in our judiciary was eliminated. You still have unjust enrichment and that sort of thing, which. But even then, it overlaps into an area of, of rules, and et cetera. But I approach this from the standpoint that, that I, as, the, um, as a free man who has been registered as such under, uh, under in New York, it's the Estate Trust and, and um, uh, Powers Act, uh, I have ceased to allow for the state to be the trustee over me, and I'm no longer the collateral because I relieved them of that, and that was filed uh, with a, that was duly filed with the court, and it's filed with the Secretary of Treasury and various people, including the governor, saying he's no longer the trustee over my body. Um, so uh, that's what I do. I've been doing that for. It's, I've studied this, and I've since the early '90s, and that I that's what I do. I, I relieve people of their. <laughs> of their indenture. I call it the surety indenture. I would so, clarify what you're with saying. With that in mind... Let me clarify what you just said. You do this as a service for other people so that they can basically yes. become free and then their children are free. So let's just... I want to make perfectly clear that no, what you're saying no, doesn't go by. No, the children... No, the children are not free. The problem is they're still registered within a marriage. See? If they're married, the, the, the children are still... The issue under the jurisdiction of the governor of the state in which they're residing. See? You reside in the United States only secondarily under the 14th Amendment through wherever state you reside in. So it's the governor who has, who has control over you, has jurisdiction you, and authority you, over you. I thought you could get people their sovereignty back. No. <laughs> only God is sovereign, and, and the Pope <laughs> says he is, and so is Queen, Queen Elizabeth. But uh, the sovereignty thing is... That's a lot. I call it uh, patriot idiot uh, nonsense, and everything else is legal paperwork, and you've got to make it stick because you're fighting um, 
like almost three or four generations of a bad education. And there, there are people who know exactly I'm, what I'm talking about in the government, and they're not allowed to talk about it. But that, um, no, I return, you cease, you become free. In other words, you be, it, you're like the baby uh, in, say, 1933 when you're born, and the people in 1933 were free. They were not the collateral. They were not taken. They were taken in booty, but there needed to be paperwork done. As soon as they started do banking again, you know, when they reopened the banks, yeah. everybody was signing a, everybody's statement based upon they were giving authority under the new funding of the banks. So they became they became the surety for their accounts, et cetera, et cetera, and the and the ability to to guarantee payment in the whole banking system under the uh, Federal Reserve. But it's all under the Emergency Banking Relief Act. It's Congress. Federal Reserve is merely a vehicle. You know, it's Congress and the president. The president is the head of the bank. Basically, he can do anything he wants. He can go in there and fire everybody at the Federal Reserve. So then, are and you he, saying he and the treasurer under? Are you saying that even once the baby's born and not registered and they're in that moment, that they're not free because of what has bound the marriage and the marriage can't right. reach exactly. sovereignty? Exactly. So, but they, I thought you help people do do that, get out of the system so that Oh they, yeah, yeah, I do. But it's a matter of it, it's a matter of filing the paperwork. You've got to whereas we all operate under statute, unfortunately. We're no there's no common law. And that it, it, common law was literally eliminated by a Supreme Court case in 1938. Doesn't exist. It was eliminated. You want to do it? You want to get common law? Go into the British system. They're, they have common law there. You can actually operate uh, under common law. And, and by common law, I mean more than than just court decisions. You know, I'm talking about a a, a tr long, rich tradition of natural law. And that uh, natural law does not apply in the United States anymore, unfortunately. What I'm what I'm saying is that that uh, within a marriage, within if somebody's not married and they have a child, the child is actually free because there is no bond. There there is no authority given to the government at that point of their of their status as the as the collateral other than the fact that you know you would mention that the uh, people who were on uh, welfare once you go on welfare you've given up authority to the government over you and if you have a baby basically an issue of a, a you know a, a birth out of wedlock that issue before it's certif certified is under the authority of the government through your welfare, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but in a in a marriage, you the government has authority, and under contract, the government has authority over the fetus, the fetus, and the issue, the, the baby, the newborn, and then that newborn is registered with, with a separate security certificate, and this becomes individually a surety, individually. Uh, up until that point, they are connected to the mother. The mother uh, obviously was there when the baby was born. And that's more than the father can say, and they're probably nowhere around. But um, even when they're married. But the, the, the key here is government authority over the person giving birth. And that's the key and factor that somebody for the leverage you're using in your lawsuit. Can you explain that leverage? Right. Uh, well, I I have read, I'm duly registered with the with the Treasury and the government generally for um, as a free person who is able to enter into a contract without a burden, and that's it's called sui generis. You know, as I'm I'm free and able to contract without any our party to the contract by by virtue of my uh, being uh, duly registered, and that as such. Um, and the government's not happy that I'm doing this because they're essentially having to answer to the emergency government that started in 33. We operate under emergency. Actually, we've operated, and I want to get off in the weeds here. In uh, 1907, there was a specie uh, panic, and that led to the 1908 um, 
uh, Aldridge Vreeland Act, which essentially said when banks when banks cannot be uh, dependent upon specie on gold and silver, they can do interbank lending with banknotes. Right? They can use paper. That was the it gave an okay that the banks have got to continue, and if it if they need to continue by using interbank lending with their own paper notes, bank notes, that they can continue for the good of the country. And Congress, it was called the Aldrich Freeland Act, and that gave and and that gave Jekyll Island the go ahead in order to do what they did with the Federal Reserve in 1912 and 13 under Wilson. So that we have operated with interbank lending as under an emergency under an emergency and whether or not we had gold is secondary to the fact is that the banks seized control of their ability to issue bank notes legally as legal tender recognized by Congress under the Aldrich Freeland Act 1908 um, so ca carrying that forward they had to really take over the entire system for good under statute and they did with the Federal Reserve Act and then with the forced panic in 1929 when they took a third of the liquidity out of the system. Now, so it was a gold-based system, so but they took a third of the liquidity out. You want your percentage yeah. of these babies. Is that what you're saying to, uh, to Cuomo and to, well, to New York? Uh, is basically you guys well, are, are basically uh, yeah. stealing the, these assets. And one way to say go after that is to acknowledge them as an asset and to say that therefore as this i guess because you're an independent person or we the people we would actually get to say to como you are we want our piece of this puzzle we want our piece of this pie which unfortunately is a piece of a baby and that's what you're actually using as your leverage is you are bargaining i am i'm saying that they're 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 committing unjust enrichment you know in a in a racketeering and basically this is racketeering i i was trying to avoid a racketeering statement this these are not easy to do and if anything, I'm preparing for that, and uh, uh, I've asked the, the judge the ability to, which would bring in the senior executive service and Circle and a lot of other people which aren't named in the case. I tried to make it simple. And the simple thing is that the governor under the emergency has an obligation to safeguard the collateral for the debt, and the collateral of the debt is that newborn. And without due process given to that newborn, where you put it to death and sell the parts, or allow a Planned Parenthood to do it and to sell the parts, basically, and it's it's there's a political motive there because they get money from Planned Parenthood. There's there's endorsements and everything coming through the very networks which are selling the babies, all right? And there that's the racketeering aspect of this, so that. Cuomo is benefiting politically, and to, from that standpoint, he's in breach of his fiduciary duty to safeguard the actual expectation, uh, the expected collateral or the repayment of the debt. It was that once that kid is <clears throat> registered, that kid is absolutely on the radar, and that 65-year lifespan is is a participant in commerce, which is both producing and consuming. You know, they, they've tracked everybody's uh, transportation and housing and goods and food and blah, 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 education. That becomes a, 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 a gamble, in a, a knowable gamble in the, in the markets, which can be sold internationally. That's why people like to invest in the United States. They invest into the bundles as securities, Fidelity and Investments, and, and a long list of, you, know, you can get a QCIP on your birth certificate, for instance. You get a QCIP on your... On, on your on birth certificates, uh, which are sold on the depository trust company standard and pours, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just saying to you that the governor knows this, or he should, because he was educated at Fordham. And I told him this already when he, I had dragged him into court back in 2011. He knows. I gave him notice. So <clears throat> the key here, though, is that he is, he is, he is committing... He is in breach of his fiduciary duty as governor to safeguard the property of the United States, the collateral property. That fetus under his jurisdiction is the property of the United States government under the emergency government, which is expecting to use it through the lifetime of that child to pay off the debt, period. It's, it's that simple. And therefore, I'm saying 
that I can talk about this because I am not a surety. I am not their property. I've freed myself from being that property, and I'm in court. I have standing to complain. And my standing is that uh, I'm, I'm the beneficiary of the, the assets that were taken in 1933 and thereafter uh, by FTR. That was they seized all the gold. I have one ounce of gold. If we have 9,000 uh, metric tons of gold, I have, I have a claim to one ounce of that gold based upon the, the population uh, uh, a claim against the return of the property that was taken in 1933. That's all government property is our property. It's the people's property. That's as close as I get to this patriot idiot nonsense. But I'm saying that the that what makes us a citizen is that the government represents us in safeguarding our property, the national forest. That's our property, right? But if it's all been hypothecated, and if you're not free to make a claim to safeguard as a as a claim holder, I have a claim because I'm a free person. And I'm registered as such. It's not because I, I stamp twice and uh, go around, turn two circles. I'm free. That doesn't. That's not. This is not Egypt. Okay, um, you you are free because you filed the paperwork, <laughs> and that's what I do. And it's it's arcane. I uh, I don't normally get into this, but I I could speak to somebody if they're really serious about doing this. But it's not an easy easy path. But it works, and that. Uh, you can file bills of exchange and get rid of your student debt, et cetera, et cetera, and, but, and get rid of your liens, the IRS liens, et cetera. You know, the IRS is merely a the bookkeeping operation for the Federal Reserve, and that uh, uh, it's all under the executive branch. The executive, you know, Trump, that's why we're all upset about Trump, because he knows all this. He's read all my work. So with that in mind... Well, yes. you knew the Trump family. The, Your the family knew the Trump family. I mean, come on. You you have been so my, connected to everyone in New York. It's absolutely absurd. But let me just summarize. Essentially, your angle here is a very legal angle. It's not a really moral, uh, it's not a really uh, uh, warm and fuzzy angle, but or might even say compassionate angle, but it doesn't matter. It gets the job done. Because what you've done is you said babies are commodities of the state or the federal government uh, as you would explain much better than I, and that these abortions are basically taking money away from the state and that the governor is not doing his duty to protect the right of the state's assets in the future. And basically then, the people who are doing these abortions, these murders, as I would call them, these baby butchers, are getting the money from the... Harvesters. They're harvesters, and they're getting money, and that money... Uh, why would they, why should they get money? They're first off paid by we the people through taxpayers and Planned Parenthood. Right. And then right. they get a benefit of that, and then we don't add, get the benefit of the fact that that human that was murdered gets to go on in the future and be an asset to our country and to you know participate in our social system. I mean, this is the is it's like they're getting they're double dipping as well as murdering, double dipping as well as murdering. Well, I put in I put in health and human services. Because they were involved in okaying uh, the the payment of money to Planned Parenthood, right? I'm saying I've got them in there to say stop, stop giving money to Planned Parenthood because they are double, if nothing, as you say, double dipping. And in fact, the um, uh, there there is the the fact that um, uh, well, it's it. The money is being recirculated back through the Democratic Party, which is a party to the case. The uh, Tom Perez in uh, they got fifty million of that five hundred million, and that money was then you know through a cutout given to the various people who were then pushing to uh, get these Reproductive Health Act equivalents in place so they could harvest babies. So, um, yeah, I mean, basically, this is a this is a set, this this would be a, a false claim if it, if it under the proper statutory uh, uh, claim. In other words, there's a there's a sealed requirement where you can get fifteen or thirty percent of the re, any money recovered if under a false claim. A quick tam, call them quick tam. This, but this is sort of a a hybrid a case that I filed, and it's 
specifically that I'm there as a whistleblower protecting. I have a stake in this because I am a free, I'm a, 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 a sui juris, a, a person, a free person able to make contract without obligation. I, I can sit down and do a contract without having to ask anybody. That's sui juris. And you have standing so that without being an esquire. I am standing. Right, I'm standing. Right, Esquire. Yeah, but and I was they actually about called that. me Esquire. Yeah. Well, I, I like to call you Baron because you're higher than these stupid lawyers who are Esquires, who basically act like they're British landed gentry and they're some kind of uh, royalty. Now, I want to move on to this next question because you're the only person who can answer this clearly for anyone, as far as I know. Uh, other people will take a shot at it. Uh, the the big debate between abortion in the states and the federal, and now the Supreme Court wants to look at uh, Wade versus Roe. And the states are saying, we'll do what we want, because in the Constitution it says that it is not clearly defined what abortion is about or what a human is about or when you become a human. And so, therefore, it becomes a state right, because anything that is not specifically stated as a federal right in the Constitution defaults to a state's right. Now, I'm sure I said that wrong. Can you explain that to people? Well, it's, there are treaty, the treaties come in. And uh, there was a case in 1804 called the Murray versus Charming Betsy, which was a ship built in Boston that Congress had given it a flagship status, and the owner actually had sold it to a, a Danish uh, person without uh, without permission to do so. And basically, the ship in this 1803 it was seized um, as a improper transfer of the ship without the. Uh, with, without basically without Congress's permission. It was during a time of war. Any ship which has got a flagship status for the United States becomes a military vessel. So that, anyway, uh, Justice Marshall um, settled in the case that uh, uh, on what what the disposition of the charming Betsy was and uh, the schooner. So um, basically, you cannot look at congressional law without looking at international law. That's you, know, you must measure international law in order to determine whether congressional law is is in fact constitutional. The Supreme Court has original jurisdiction over all treaties, and, and Article Three Court has jurisdiction over a treaty. So I bring in the treaty arrangement under international law. There's an international law uh, that prohibits genocide, and this is under the International uh, Court of Justice. The they call it the the um, the, uh, the Statute of Rome, and um, basically the same wording in the Statute of Rome, which outlaws genocide and human rights violations, is in fact in the, what's called the Proxmire Act. After World War II, Proxmire was so reviled by what happened in in terms of genocide and human rights violations, he he spent his entire career trying to pass the Anti Genocide Act. And he did it in uh, 1988. It was one of his last. Uh, this is a man out of Illinois um, who he was actually married into the Rockefeller family, and he was so reviled about this. He, so he passed the Proxmire Act. It's uh, 18 U.S.C. 1091, and the same violation language is that of the international, the the, the Rome, the, the Statute of Rome, which is the International Criminal Court. So. What I'm arguing is that the Proxmire Act it applies here as, a, as an act of genocide uh, on the murder of, of this um, child who was unregistered. You know, it's sort of a waste. You know, it's like it, it's, they treat it as like it's some sort of bed bug or something. And a matter of fact, um, under medical terminology, they considered a growth in the mother, you know, a, a disease. So that much must be uh, expert extirpated. So, um, but so international co international law is applied through the Parksmire Act in my case, and I'm saying that um, the states cannot overrule the international law as it relates to human rights violations and to um, and, and to genocide specifically which is then reflected in the Proxmire Act of 1988. <clears throat> so that the rehabilit no, the re I keep on saying rehabilit, it's the Reproductive Health Act, which is a Jesuit misuse of words. <laughs> it's, you know, the, 
the Theft of Human Beings Act um, mm-hmm. that uh, was passed in, in January of this year is a violation of the international criminal statute. It's called the Statute of Rome, which is the International Criminal Court. They're violating human rights and they're creating genocide. And the Proxmire Act in 88 reflects that so that the state of New York cannot violate federal law as it relates to the selective murder of babies. That's what it says. That's what the inter- you cannot single out babies for death. Right? That's what the International Court says, and that's what the Proxmire Act says. But the New York Act is different, and that's sort of the, the mix of this thing that the judge has got on his plate. And uh, he gave me an opportunity to reverse his denial, because this is not easy stuff. It, it, this is Judge Hurd out of Utica, New York, he gave him a chance to, uh, to reverse his position on a genocide. And they get, I filed papers uh, last Friday which are now in the docket. And uh, unfortunately, I, I, I keep on going, I, I, I keep on going to use the word rehabilitative rather than reproductive because it's not reproductive, but <laughs> it's not the Reproductive Health Act. It's sort of the, the Genocide Act. That's, I, anyway, I used the wrong term when I was doing the acronym. But nonetheless, so then, Christopher, <laughs> off on the, states can't have yep. abortion because that's genocide. Then why is the well? Federal- they can't. They can't. You know, is that there is three court cases that the Supreme Court just uh, and the district courts just uh, ruled on. Two of them out of Indiana, where um, under Pence, he was very much against abortion, and before he left as governor, he. He pushed a, a a case regarding you cannot single out a an a fetus to be put to death based upon a DNA study that if somehow it's got uh, brown eyes instead of blue or it's boy instead of a girl and he is against eugenics he doesn't want you to, to he didn't want Indiana to kill kids because they had the potential uh, DNA makeup of a Down syndrome or some other uh, some other uh, different, uh, rehabilitative problem you know in terms of they had this they would have a disability when born and there this is exactly what hitler did exactly and of course hitler came he sent his people over to new york to talk to the new york uh, you know the margaret sanger crowd the Gen- the eugenic society in order to figure out how to properly model german law which became the nuremberg code along with the confederates uh, uh, laws that were adopted against Jews and others, it's selective targeting. So there, there are three cases the, in Indiana. One was the uh, whether or not you uh, had to um, incinerate or to give the body parts of the fetus proper burial. Now that one got a very interesting response yesterday by the Supreme Court, and there was a battle between Ginsburg and and Thomas and others where. You had to give the baby body parts a burial, right? You know, as you had to treat them as a person. Like that, that upset people to no end, and that's why Pence is so reviled because he he wanted to give the fetus a proper burial. In other words, you can't sell the parts because it's got to be incinerated or whatever, right? It's got to be given a plot, you know. Uh, and uh, so that was one of the cases. The other one is you can't selectively kill fetus is just because you don't like the color of the eyes, right? Um, and then th- th- there was a third case, which out of North Carolina, which was uh, the uh, the Veritas Project, uh, the, the case was given a directive uh, decision because it was about to go to trial, and the judge, this is a federal judge, absolutely said, I don't want this going through the process and besmirching my name. So he just did, he was about to go to the jury where um, the Veritas was being sued for defamation by the people who were committing crimes and because he was recording this uh, secretly, right? And this helps uh, uh, Julian Assange and others who were, you know, it helped uh, um, uh, Mike Douglas who was doing undercover uh, recordings and, uh, um, you know, it, it, that North Carolina case essentially said is that you have a right to investigate 
and to do it in a way which is generally for the good of people to know, and especially when you're investigating crime. And so that was a directive verdict. In other words, he, the judge just say, threw it in the wastebasket. He says, you know, you know, he just threw it out before it went to the jury because he didn't want that jury reviewing it. So that's good. That was a good case. And that, uh, I, think, I think it happened on Friday, but uh, it got announced yesterday. So those two cases from Indiana, very important. You can't, you can't do eugenics, Douglas. That's what it said. The Supreme Hooray. Court. And they were arguing. Uh, they were arguing. Uh, they were arguing. She's gonna. She's rolling over her, her I, grave. Well, look, Sanger is an interesting person. She was, she was one out of eleven kids. The mother, <clears throat> um, out of Corning, New York. The mother. This is farming time where women used to die. Okay, women. Many women died in childbirth. It was a terrible. Uh, ordeal for women because they had expectation of death. So you have to put it, you have to put Margaret Sanger, who became a, a public health nurse and a nurse and her both sons, she married an architect and both sons uh, became doctors who lived in Westchester and actually my mother knew them. Right? My mother was a public health nurse who was reviled by the, the Dust Bowl and the, uh, the, and the conditions of public health in, in the in, in, for instance, Camden, New Jersey, and et cetera. She was a public health nurse. She worked for Metropolitan Life and, and visited people with TB and that sort of thing. You know, the health conditions in this country during the debris, we've got, I think there were 10 million people who died. I mean, this, this was genocide going on as a result of FDR and, um, and uh, his uh, Secretary of uh, uh, Agriculture who destroyed the agricultural structure through his scientific farming, like, like Senko. <coughs> so Henry Wallace, he called the, he caused the dust bowl. Henry Wallace did. So, um, and as we know, Margaret you know, Sanger's I'm lawyer saying, for the eugenicist group Planned Parenthood was of course, with Gates. Gates. Yes, indeed. Right. And, and, and his now, son, the Microsoft leader, is out to kill as many people as he can, and he's proud to announce it. All you have to do well, is he, listen he, to his talks. Yes, he about announces Africa. it. He, is, he announces it. He's throughout Africa. He's murdering them, and uh, it, it somehow it runs in the Gates family. But look, Margaret Sanger, when she saw the, the the terrible conditions that women were without, she was first for birth control. Does anybody have a chance? Uh, when, when when it goes to the Supreme Court, which I don't think it belongs there, but you're saying it, it does, and I didn't understand that law, the technicality of international laws impinging uh, upon the whole circumstance I didn't get, and that the state can't, in fact, violate international genocide lies, laws by allowing right. abortion or allowing Planned Parenthood. So then why does the Supreme Court think that a woman has the right to kill a baby, even when she's in labor, birthing that child, she can still decide at that moment in some states now, supposedly, to murder well, that baby. But see, I don't. This look, Roe v. Wade was a fraud on the court, the district court in uh, I think it was Texas. What happened was that um, uh, the woman who had a drug problem and several, uh, she had three pregnancies. She had never had an abort abortion. She gave up her first child, unmarried, and she gave up the second child. And that the lawyers who wanted to profiteer on this thing were the ones who did that, and that uh, who, who convinced her to say that she had been gang raped, and that's how they they filed the case with a with a with a fraudulent uh, uh, allegation that she had been gang raped, and it went to the federal court saying that the the Texas law was unconstitutional because it uh, it didn't put forward the exception of rape, incest, or the uh, health of the mother. But the point is, she went ahead and had the baby anyway, put it up to her adoption, adoption, and she admit, and she became one of the most vociferous as a Catholic, one of the most most vociferous anti-abortion people, and she died just recently. So the whole Roe v. Wade thing was a fraud on the court. And as far as I'm concerned, it should be, it should be reviewed as a fraud. And that the, the whole issue, uh, 
and this is where attorneys, attorneys, they're, they're a criminal class. They're a criminal class, Douglas. And I, and I know a lot of attorneys who are good attorneys, but even the good ones I know who are sort of, they look for the loopholes, man. Oh, Everybody yeah. looks for the loopholes. If you can play my both loophole sides, is the Proxmire Act. Yeah, if you can play both sides, my, then my you're loophole lying. is the prox, the prox, right? Oh, but they have they have an obligation to win. Yep. Right. And so the, one attorney will tell you always tell you that they're never going to sue a fellow attorney. They won't do it. That's right. So even though when they they know they're rotten, our people want to know yeah. this: what's going to happen? Are the states going to have the right? Is the Supreme Court going to take this back and make a decision? You know probably better than anyone. Where is this going to go? It's got to be viewed under international law. And that's my argument, that the Proxmire Act and, and William Proxmire wanted to make it part of international law, the Proxmire Act, and that the states had no right to kill children because when they single out a child to, for death without, you know, <clears throat> I, I don't know where it's going to go. I'm so upset with the judicial system in general, especially out in Ninth Circuit. I've been out there, and that uh, the problem is all the lawyers let it happen, man, because they want to practice. They don't want to lose their license. These these licks, they're licensed to make money, man, hmm. and that um, I. I think that there are a sufficient number of judges on the court, even Ginsburg would agree uh, that, um, you know, she's nominally Jewish, then, but she's a radical out of Brooklyn, um, where I hail from, that uh, even she will draw a line. <laughs> um, it, it's the way... It's the way that the cases have been fashioned. And my case is fashioned properly as a as a treaty issue. Uh, under again, it's the a charming Betsy, a Murray versus charming Betsy, uh, eighteen oh four under the Marshall Court, and that uh, uh, a state law cannot outlaw when it comes to genocide or human rights violations cannot outlaw. Um, it cannot. It's got to be seen as aberrant and has got to be taken to task so that's the art that's the angle that i bring in now ginsburg loves international treaties man this is her deal right for her to come out and attack the uh, the the statute of rome on human rights violations would go against her grain that's why i did this in the way i did it. you know i want to keep her propped up at the end of the table now thomas uh, you look at the Alabama case that was just uh, in the last few days, the last weeks. Um, all of the all of the states are awakening on this issue, and uh, I think that Cuomo is upset now because he he's done more to uh, he, he's now desperately said he's running for the fourth term of office in, <laughs> in 2002. Right? He's going to re I'm going to run for office again. Right? Lots of luck. So. Uh, he's he is having to answer. They, you know, it's it's one thing to paint me with a broad brush, and I love to do that. But they're walking a very narrow line when they do it in the way that they're doing it. Because the judge, I'm I'm not I'm not emotional here, right? I'm this is strictly the law. Yeah, and that's this what is, I like about your approach. And, 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 and I, I want to jump to another question. The Supreme Court is not yeah, supposed to right. write law. They are supposed to interpret the Constitution. I find nowhere in the Constitution that says that a woman can murder a baby in a late-term abortion. Is uh, so when it, I don't care about Wade versus Roe. It's as you say a fraudulent case plus why are they making the uh, a case law determination the way that we're supposed to handle all states abortions? That doesn't make any sense to me. So well, why why don't they stick with the Constitution and please show me where there is a there's a point in the Constitution that says a woman gets to murder a late term abortion baby? Well, first of all, it's a state issue because the um, the, the everything built on Roe v. Wade is built on a house of cards. It's not it's not there's no good foundation because it was a fraud on the court. So are you saying the whole thing this is, is going to come back to the states? 
Is that what you're saying? It has to go back to the state. Right. Oh my! And that if, if in fact, if in fact, well, that's where it belongs. But the problem here is that, again, without proper care, if you can't reverse the baby where the baby's head is going to come out first, you've got to do a cesarean. And uh, you know, Caesar was born as a cesarean baby. <laughs> you know, he's not born a woman. He was taken from a woman through cesarean section, Caesar. Uh-huh. Um, so, you know, you get, when you come through the birth canal and get born and go through birth, you're given your, your immunities and everything else. You're, you're, uh, as my mother said, you know, you can tell somebody who's breastfed because they are well-spoken, but that, um, a cesarean birth should be legal. And basically, if, in fact, there's a trouble, and there are many, many a troubled um, you know, etopic uh, pregnancies, you know, where they're not properly attached, you know, there's, uh, Tyler can speak to all these issues, I, but that, I can only speak secondarily, but, I, look, there is a health issue at a point when the baby is not properly uh, formed, and uh, there's no excuse in, the, I mean, in, these, in this day and age, because as Margaret Sanger wanted. It was a birth control for women so that they, you know, women had no rights. Women were merely a, a donkey. They're actually a lower level than a donkey. Um, and they, under Sharia law, they're, they're a piece of property in that women, men would treat them, you know, the machismo, which is actually Islam. It's, you know, we think it's, uh, we think it's, um, uh, Spanish related, but it's actually came through Spain through Islam. It's bachismo. No, women are treated like a vessel and thrown out, and that uh, without the morning after pill, without the various birth control, the you know the the diaphragms or whatever, you know, women were burdened with these births that they could n- not do anything with, and they in effect uh, became the the sexual plaything of their husband. Um, or general, you know, in, in Islam, you know, a, a woman who complains essentially could be put to death, you know, of a rape, gang rape. So there are some serious issues that Margaret Sanger was looking at, and I, and I understand them, and I'm and I, at a point that a woman the day after does not take the morning after pill for um, getting rid of this uh, the previous night's uh, action or previous week's action has in fact through free will accepted the birth what i'm saying douglas is that there's enough out there to separate a choice which is uh, productive health care and the intent to have that baby going into the second term that's intent that is mens re mens re and that the, the mother at that point, because they didn't, she didn't give free choice and, and act to do something before then, is, is uh, responsible. And women, our society is so involved in, in um, adoptions that uh, the whole adoption process has got to be straightened out where women can know that they can give up that child because they have, from a moral standpoint, don't want to abort the child. And that, that's what the, the woman in, Ro, in uh, Jane Roe uh, did. She was against abortion, and she gave birth to the child. Her previous child was given up. And she had one, one child that she raised herself, but the two other ones were given up for adoption. Now, that we should, we should treat children as a precious commodity that is very hard to come by. The labor involved for a woman is considerable. They have to be respected for what they go through. That labor is, and I, I argue, is not taxable. You can't tax that labor. That's her labor. Anything it's, which is a person's labor is their property. So that um, if, the, if the woman wants to give up her property in, abortion, in, a, in adoption, so be it. But she has an obligation to safeguard that fetus because she has free will to do so and she has the technology to do so also 
and if she's afraid of a uh, of, of death giving birth in labor, she can get a cesarean. As I say, they were doing that back in the time of Rome. The way our system is, our banking system is set up, that they're figuring they can make more money, you know, by skimming this uh, body parts on the side without sharing the squill and that uh, it's theft. It's theft from me personally if, in fact, we're paying for it. There's, basically, when the government pays money through Health and Human Services for that pregnancy, that, uh, that's a surety. That's a government, that is a government um, contract for the safe birth of that baby. That is, it's there with, through the money given by the government during the, the prenatal care process. And then there, so what I'm saying here is that I have no, I'm not passing um, a judgment here other than there's a lot of um, shenanigans going on here, Douglas, and it's, and the court system has got to be held to a higher standard of truth. And there is some truth out there and they're not doing it. It's a bunch of lies. When I heard the argument between Justice Thomas and Ginsburg just yesterday, coming out of that decision, they were upset. Now, if that makes them upset and they're willing to argue the truth, hey, so be it. Let's do it. And that's where I want to go. I want to. I want Judge Heard to give me a declaratory judgment on the emergency government, whether that exists. And under the emergency government, there is a there is an asset. Um, that's involved through the through the marriage uh, of the mother and father of the fetus or the newborn that that makes that newborn the property whether it's registered or not as a self self standing surety you know through the birth certificate but that is the property of the emergency government under this banking system. I, it's not an easy subject here. I'd prefer not to make the argument, Douglas but that the Supreme, this needs to go to the Supreme Court. They have original jurisdiction over all treaties, over all equities. The only equity court other than in uh, divorce court and bankruptcy court is the only equity court per se. And this is an equity question because the, the, <laughs> the babies are not uh, registered as a security at the time that they're newborn uh, and taken for body parts and harvested through, you know, the, the keeping them alive in incubators so they can get better pieces like uh, Planned Parenthood was doing. Um, well, Christopher, I'm uh, not going to go into my diatribe because what you have just delivered is a clear, level-headed, legal approach to a way to get leverage on the situation. You've given us a thorough legal background in this, which I didn't have, and I didn't consider many things that you've told us today and now that you have it puts a whole new perspective on it and I just take it out of my own emotional response which is a very negative emotional response uh, especially how crazy it's gotten and to put it in perspective with uh, uh, you know a, a very calm clear legal perspective is what we need in this and I, I just thank you because the, what you're doing is you're always putting it on the record and look at Roe versus Wade. If someone didn't bring that to court, or if many of these cases didn't come to court, things wouldn't get done. So unfortunately, it takes legal action in the court system to cause people to do their job. Their job should have already been done, but because we have to take it to court and decisions have to be made, we have to put it in the right perspective. And your ideas about uh, international treaties and genocide and the state's rights and, and what the uh, Supreme Court really uh, can and can't do and how we have to consider these children in terms of the way the government would consider them in terms of the way a court would consider them is not the way that we as a moral Christian would look at it so uh, it's very important perspective you bring you always bring the a perspective that shows that you are on the path to try to bring morality into uh, really law and to bring what is right back into what so many times I have to call fake justice. So we praise you. We give you blessings and we hope that you your case prevails and that we just want to support you and thank you again for so much clarity that you bring for us and a perspective that literally I don't know anyone else who has your perspective except some of your friends. Well, I wanted to... 
I wanted to add here, Douglas, that I started on this whole issue of the dilemma that we're all facing through the court system. I, I you know, I'm, I'm from Brooklyn. I was around uh, uh, rabbis and people with numbers on their arm who were actually as children in the concentration camps. And I, and I, and I studied Judaism and I studied the whole process during the time that uh, Rabin was murdered and in what 97 and i was i i was studying to be an anthropologist i went through a whole cycle of the the jewish year and actually went to synagogue for a year <clears throat> and i asked the minion i asked the president of the minion uh what is important to really do here regarding the genocide and everything that went on they said that it's important to create a record and that <laughs> and, they, and these were people with numbers on their arm right so when you once you've created a record, it becomes permanent. And as John Loftus said, is that when the wall came down in the Soviet Union, yeah, you know, he was able to go to the KGB. He went into the files in Moscow, the KGB, and actually found out what American history is. You can't get American history in the United States. John Loftus had to go to uh, uh, Moscow to the former former Soviet Union to look at their files. So the permanent record must be there in order to read and that's what I I do and you know it's on it's in pacer all my stuff is in pacer and that um, so that the rabbi said create a permanent record that's the best thing you can do historically and that's why I'm doing it you know I I have personal I went through this personally with my own family and that I don't want to get into over the phone but that this is I have direct experience. I know what I'm talking about. I went through it. I'm, I'm helping people who, you should see the women who have been married five times and the problems they have where the, every time that the paperwork for a marriage happens, they, they go through gyrations and name changes and all sorts of gyrations where the man doesn't do anything, man. Right? So women do have problems and I respect that. And I do, <laughs> but they have responsibilities. They are the grail. I mean, you're into, you're into the whole issue of the, of, um, the, those aspects of our history that we cherish. The grail being the woman, you know, of that which gives uh, history its, its future. Right? The women. It's women who are the key. You know, you realize you can't hold a, a, um, you can't go to to a, a. Uh, a service, a ceremony, without the women being there to light the candles. You know, it's, it's unlike uh, it's unlike Islam, where they don't want women there. But in Judaism, you've got to have the woman there to light the candles, or else you can't have a ceremony, right? So I, I think Judaism is entire, entirely applicable, and I've been I've followed this very closely, and I think it's important. Other than Christianity, you know, there's a whole Christian issue here, but. Judaism had issue, had done uh, had done studies on the issue of abortion and the, the the personhood of the child. That's in the Old Testament, and I'm sure you've read this stuff. You, this is your expertise. So I appreciate the the time you've given me here, you and Tyler, to speak on this, and uh, I'll keep you in the loop as things happen. I I um, well, thank you, Christopher. You know, our uh, supporters and our followers just love. The fact that you know you suffer, you sacrifice, you put yourself on the line, and you have for decades to really fight the good fight. And so, for those unborn children and for the women that you have just given the proper praise to, I just want to thank you for standing up for their rights and and, and the rights of the future and the rights of these unborn children to really come into this world without meeting these kind of um, genocidal thoughts that they have to get through in terms of. Uh, abortion that they have to face when the child is looking at the world. I mean, this is a scary world that they're coming into, and it's only because people with courage like yourself that this world can stand up and fight the fight against evil so that unborn children can still have rights in this world. So again, Christopher, thank you so much. Keep up the good work, and we'll talk with you soon.